You know, that fox is so nice. There we go. So we're going to record now. And uh, it's not. Is it too fox. loud here, guys, with the blowers going outside? No, oh, I don't, can't hear it. Oh, can't okay. hear them. I'm good. And then I'm going to. Uh, so I'm going to switch to. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to set this up so you can see what's up here. I don't want to do that. <laughs> don't want center stage. I want to switch to active viewer. So, uh, yeah, Tony, I, you can mute because I think the blower is is uh, okay. It's switching you. So, okay, good. So can you see my uh, see my thing on the full screen? You can see your face on the full screen. Okay, all right. So I've got to turn off the center stage thing. There we go. All right, so there's the ones that I've tied. <laughs> and they're all kind of different colors. And I'll show you a little bit better. This one is, is uh, get the light on it. So you can see this one's sort of a red and black mix. Um, this one is a uh, is sort of a tan, a copper color, a little bit of black, copper and black. I've got uh, the black and blue one, which I'm going to tie. Um, there's one that's got a dark olive, and there's some lighter olive ones. So you can you can mix up colors on these things quite well. Uh, by using different kinds of dubbing. Now, the one that I've got in the vise here is the uh, blue and black one, which is the bruised leech that uh, Phil Rowley talks about. Uh, this one uses a 532nd bead and a size 8 hook, but I'm going to tie it on a slightly smaller one that uses a little, little smaller hook. That's, that's it there. So that's a smaller, a smaller hook. Um, we were talking about the beads earlier. This is with a 532nd bead. And I mount the bead so that it's uh, about two, two bead diameters in front of where the turned up eye is there. I don't know why you're not showing it full screen here. That's very weird. Hope this comes through in the recording better. So this this is a a five thirty second bead, and and you can see it's got about two gaps in front, and that's on a size eight hook. And to do that, because the hole on the five thirty second bead is pretty big, a standard uh, the pins I normally use for the smaller ones goes right through the hole. So I've got some proper uh, dressmakers pins, and of course these ones you have to cut. And as we talked earlier, when you cut them, it, it leaves a rough edge. See, I've had it break off my thread, so I had sanded off the, uh, the rough edge. Um, so now that that's set up, I'll show you what I use for the slightly smaller ones. And the one that I'm going to tie is the uh, bruise leech that Rolly talks about, and this uses uh, Arizona uh, semi-simulated seal, which is a synthetic, and it uses a mixture of black and blue. Uh, so I can get that out so you can see it a little better. This is, it's got a lot of flash in it, and the most of the flash is a bluish color. The black is, is pretty opaque. So it gives that little blue flash in it and it, it lightens up the black a bit. And the beads I'm using for this one are 1-8 uh, tungsten. And with a 1-8 tungsten, the head of the hole in the bead is good enough that I can use these little things called sequin pins. And the sequin pin is this little guy here with a fairly small head. And that avoids having to cut it. 
when you put it on the, on the hook. I'm gonna put this on a size 10. And we talked about hooks a bit. I th think a short, as we talked earlier, short shank hook I think is preferable because it gives the fish less, le less leverage. Now the Hannock ones, they come in the Jig Classic and they only make them up to size eight. I don't think they make a size six. Um, and this, this, that's the standard, standard jig. Then they make this one called Jig Superb. It only goes up to size 10. And the ni nice thing about this one that is the point of that hook turns up a little bit. And I think that's gonna help hold the fish on a little better because uh, if the, because it's a jig hook, when you pull up on the eye as you're fighting the fish, that's gonna tend to rotate the hook and unhook. So if you're dealing with a barbless hook, I think having the turned up point is going to help with holding power. Now, put that in the vise. Level. And then I, I take, I'm going to use six op thread because you have to actually cover up the back hole on the bead to keep it from sliding on the, on the pin. And you need the thread to build up a bit of a bump behind the bead. And so you need a little heftier thread for that. So I dress the hook shank right down to the point. And then I come back up to the, where the bend starts. Nice thing about these beads is if you put them on the table and roll them around till they're uh, they've got the, the big hole facing up. You just turn them so that the big hole is facing up. Come on, up. Then you just stick the bead through and it will, uh, it's being ornery this morning. Stick the bead through the big hole so that the eye, the, the head of the pin hides in the large hole on the bead. And then I put the pin on the hook and hold it lightly with my left hand. And I'll make three or four wraps just to hold it on top of the hook. Then I'll adjust the length of how far out in front that bead sticks. And what I want for this fly is I want that bead to be about two bead widths when it's at the front, two bead widths between the back of the bead and the bent down eye of the hook. I found that tends to balance it so that the hook balances quite nose down actually. Because when I put the tail on this thing, it's gonna be heavier at the back. And I want a little bit of extra room in front of the eye to wrap some body. And I bring my thread up to the, behind the bead, and this is where I build a, a thread dam in behind the bead. I have to make enough of a sort of a tapered dam behind the bead to hold it in place so it's not gonna slide back anymore. And from hey, there, yes. Do you, do you ever, uh, what I do uh, with my balanced leeches, uh, when with the pin is when I put the uh, bead on, I actually dip the head of the pin in some lacquer and then let uh -huh. the bead hang down and it helps to hold it in place. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know if you've ever tried that. No, nope. this stuff. Oh yeah. For nine bucks from Home Deep Home Hardware. It's brushable super glue. So when I get to this point, I take it out. And when, when you use this little vial thing, don't let the tip of the brush top the edge, touch the edge of the, of the holder, the, the bottle, or it, it'll glue its cap back on. <laughs> and I just okay, put a little- Dave, I have one question here. Yeah. Okay, this is where I start to, um, how do you know your leech is balanced at this stage or head down? <laughs> you don't, unless you put you did, it on, you did on a pin or- an error on, You do trial and error on one. And then from that point on, you, you, uh, you figure it out. And I, I found 
<coughs> with these one eighth beads on this particular hook. If I leave two bead diameters in front, and the same is true on, on the, the number eights that I did, I've got that 5 30 second speed. And you see there's about two bead diameters between the eye of the hook and the back of the bead. Mm. And I found that's enough. Okay. Any closer and- So you and don't, I, you don't but, check every one? No, oh. I, I, I'll, ch I'll, I'll do one until I, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll do it and then <laughs> a little trick. I'll tie it long, take my thread off, balance it. And if it's balancing too far down, I'll take my pliers and I'll just go tap, tap to push the bead back to where it balances. And then from that on, that point on, I use, use that for all of them. Yeah, and-, and the, you, just eyeball, you just eyeball it. Yeah, the other thing is, what you do is you just tie the uh, pin uh, uh, with the bead onto the hook, but just do a light tie with yep. a few wraps and test yep. it out with a wire and you find what you like as your balance point. Yep. And then you just use that same measurement going forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and like I say, I, I'll tie them long to start with. And then if it balances two nose down, I'll just tap the bead a little bit on the front and it pokes it back a bit. It'll make it slide through the windings that are on the hook. And then I put the super glue on. And after that, it's not going anywhere. So once I get there, I'm going to tie the tail. Now I'm using, you guys have used a variety of things, I gather, fox fur and uh, marabou. Uh, Phil sa says rabbit strip. So I've got myself a cross-cut rabbit strip that has fairly long fibers. And instead of trying to cut them off the leather while it's attached, I'll take my scissors and I'll separate out how much of a bunch I want. I want fairly robust. And I'll cut the rabbit strip right there. And then what I'll do is I'll pinch all that stuff together and I will trim off the leather at the bottom of the rabbit strip. There we go. Clean, clean it up. Now, you'll see that my rabbit tail is a little bit longer than the shank of the hook because I'm going to tie it in with my thread just back where the point is. So there's a little bit of a gap between there and the pin is. I'm gonna lay down the rabbit strip where the cutoff part is right at the back of the pin and tie it down towards the pin. And then I'm gonna wrap back from there, back right to the bend, just before the bend starts so that the rabbit strip sticks straight out the back. Now for flash, I've got this Mirage Flashaboo, which is kind of an opalescent material, and it's quite fine. And I like it because it, it is fine. It's not stiff. It has a bit of flexibility to it. And I'll take a single strand, fold that in half, and cut it in half. Take the first strand and fold it over the thread in half. And I'll tie that on the near side of the hook, right back where the tail is. And I'll take the second strand And this is, again, is, is Phil's general technique. And I think it works pretty well to get the, uh, the flash in the right place. And then I'll tie that one on the far side of the hook. I can slide that thread right down to the side of the hook and then wrap over top of it so that it sits slightly on top of the rabbit tail. And I pick up all of the little ends and I'll come with my scissors and cut them about the same length as the rabbit fur tail. So now I have a, a good piece of flash that's mixed in with the rabbit. Now comes the fun part. <laughs> I'll take my thread and my dubbing twister. And I like, I like this guy. It has these little hooks that are quite flexible. If you pull on it, they'll pull together. 
and it's got enough weight that when you spin it, it'll spin like crazy. Um, I'll hook it on there, one on either eye of that dubbing twister, and I'll put enough thread down that it's about, I'd say three and a half to four inches of, of thread. Bring my thread back up to the shank, go around behind it to close the top of the loop. And then I'll bring, leave that hang, bring my thread all the way up behind the eye, and I'll do a, a quick two turn whip finish and snug it down. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm gonna use my rotary feature on the vise to wrap my body. And so I have the bobbin rest out in front with my thread hanging out of the way. I wanna dub the semi seal through that dubbing loop. And this is one of the few times I will use dubbing wax because uh, it helps the, the stuff sit in the dubbing loop. So I, I'm gonna run a little dubbing wax up and down the dubbing loop. And that's gonna help the semi seal sit in the dubbing loop. And here's the patch of dubbing material. And I find the trick with this is to take small pinches and slightly pull them out so that they're long wise. You can see there's a little bit of a length to that. And before I insert it in the loop, I'll give it a little bit of a, a twist in my fingers like that. Then I'll stick it in the loop and push it up to the fly. And you can see there's about an equal amount of dubbing material sticking out on either side of the loop. And, and the reason for that is I want this thing to spin up, spin up with lots of material sticking out to the sides. Same thing again, a little bit of a twist and in the dubbing loop and slide it up. And I'll just keep doing that, pull it out so that it's length, got some length, that little twist between my fingers and slide them up. And the idea is to build up enough material in this dubbing loop that you can make a reasonably robust body, but you want a lot of stuff sticking out the sides. This is what gives the, the length. And I think it's what gives the breathability to the fly. Um, it, it's a little, quite different from the way Florin ties his, which is a very compact skinny body. I, I like these ones that have a little more uh, movement in them. Because if you've ever, have you ever seen a, watched a leech swim? They don't undulate so much as they, they uh, squeeze up and stretch out, squeeze up and stretch out when they swim. And so sometimes you'll see them, they look like little, little blobs, and then they'll look out long and skinny. Uh, they have a, a pulsating movement when they swim. Keep going here. And it takes a few minutes here to get this all sorted. And I'll try and have a little more thicker dubbing at the bottom end of this loop than I have at the top, because I want to be a little more sparse at the tag end than, I, than at the front. Now, when I get there, that's probably enough to do the fly. I'm gonna hang it down. And I'm going to give it a quick spin, just a few spins, and get my fingers in here now and try and even it out a little bit so that the, the thickness and, and width is about the same all the way along. And then I'll spin the living daylights out of it. So that it becomes a nice, fine little rope. And before I wrap this thing, I have my dubbing tool, which has got a piece of Velcro on the end of a popsicle stick. And any place where it looks at, like it's too thin and it's, it's uneven, I'll take the thin parts 
and I'll pick it out a little bit with the dubbing tool so that it looks like a, a nice even fuzzy rope the whole length. Then I will rotate the vise and I will wrap the body from back to front. So and you're I, actually, you're effectively making a chenille out of the uh, semi-seal. That's, that's exactly right, yeah. When I get to where the eye is, I will come up over and underneath in front of the eye. And I will do that again, make it a little thicker there, and then keep going until I get right behind the bead. And at that point, I'm gonna pull back on the, the dubbing and hope, get rid of my bobbin rest. And I'll hold, I hold the, uh, the dubbing loop up at the right at a 45 angle, pass the thread through there about three times, cinch it down really good. And then I'll go back here and wrap three times in front, get my scissors in here. And I'm just gonna get up against the thread and try and snip that off, Put like that. At that point, the dubbing part is done. And I will do a double three turn whip finish. Being a belt and suspenders kind of guy, I wanna make two whip finishes. And Snug it down, turn it off. Now, we are not finished. <laughs> um, I'm going to take my, I do take my little tool again, and I will go and I'll just pick at it a bit like this and rough it up a bit so it goes all fuzzy. This is not a neat and tidy little body. It's all fuzzy. Wet my fingers a little bit and I will slick it back so that I've got a nice even round around the body. Now that's not done yet. I will take my, uh, I got a little piece of wire here. I'm gonna put through the eye of the hook take it out of the vise. And you'll see at this point now, because I've already pre-done a bunch of these, you'll see that it's hanging slightly point down, no, nose down. And that's what you want. That's where you want to place that bead so that it, the whole fly. Now, when it gets wet, the, the, the fur, the rabbit fur is going to hold a little more moisture and it's going to get a little wetter. So it'll tend to be a little less point down, almost flat. Now I'm gonna run away for two seconds because I'm gonna get this glass full of hot water because now we need to shape it. And I'll be back in a sec. Yeah, that was interesting. Dave told me about that hot water and it really makes a difference to the fibers. Yes, it does. I um, I saw that on a I don't know with a Phil Rowley or um, Brian Chen uh, in one of their video. Oh, oh, actually, Phil Rowley because Brian Chen doesn't uh, hasn't done many ties in a while. But I think Phil Rowley had done that trick as well, and I think that's right. what I saw it. So here's my here's my glass of water. Here's my fly. I'm gonna put the little puppy down in there. And I'm, it, it's, it's hot, not, it's not boiling, but it's hot. And what that does is that takes some of the kink out of that synthetic material. And as I pull it out of the water, you will see how it goes all nice and skinny. And if I take the wire out now, and I will use my fingers to stretch and stroke avoiding the point eye, all of this uh, dubbing material backwards. 
So this forms the fly shape. And put it in the vise, and you can see how long and skinny it is, even though it started out really fuzzy. Now, what I do now is I'll dry it off of here so you can see that it, it keeps that, that shape. Now, just to show you why you do, why you do this, what, what I like about the dubbing routine as opposed to a chenille or something like that, is I'm gonna put this uh, wire back through the eye on the loop. So it is a nice torpedo shape now. When I take it out again, you'll see, see how that's balancing now? Because the tail is, is, is damp, it's now gonna sit almost level. If I put it in the water again, you will see, even when it's wet, you'll see how that dubbing stuff pulses. As you stroke it through, it's gonna go skinny. But every time you stop it, it's gonna go skinny and then it's gonna go fat every time you stop it. I, I think that gives a whole whack of action to this fly. And I'm sure that's why Phil uses the dubbing loop deal is that it intended to cause the fly to change shape when it's being stripped or when it's bouncing up and down on, on a strike indicator. So that's Phil's bruised leech or balanced leech, the bruised leech, the way he ties the bruised leech using the semi seal. So there you go. Yeah, that water thing with the hot water made such a difference to my flies. Yeah, it, it just they shape out. I'm quite pleased. Yeah, they shape nice. And what I like is, like I say, when you strip it, it's going to go skinny. And the minute you stop, it's going to fuzz out. And if you watch leeches swim, that's what they do. They go, they, when they stretch out, they're swimming. And when they stop, they go fat. So, and I've used leeches a lot uh, on a strength indicator for the most part. Unlike Florin, I haven't used them much in, in the uh, running water. But I can see in, 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 in stripped in, in uh, running water, they would be mostly skinny. But if you get them in a pocket or a hole or something, or you let it drift a bit, they're going to fuzz out again. And I think anything that causes the fly to look like it's alive and not just a plastic, you know, if plastic worms worked, <laughs> you could tie things out of plastic. But I remember years ago, my dad had a bunch of little plastic flies and we never caught anything on it ever. So there you go. Now, just a quick run through. That's the black uh, and blue. I've got one here that is a bloody leech material that is quite reddish in color. Um, here's another one that's called Canadian black that has a bit of orange in it, orange and, and uh, red and blue. It's got a mix of, of dyes. And then here's the olive one, Canadian olive. It's, a, it's mostly olive, but it's got a little bit of red and, and green in it. And then there's the straight, what they call black magic, which is, uh, which is just black with a little bit of blue and a teeny bit of red in it. So there's a whole raft of those. You can get them in a, a raft of different sh shades and colors. And I would, if I were you, Tony, if you, where you're going, you don't know what's going to work. So I'd tap all a raft of different colors. They were quite specific. Yeah. Orange and orange and chartreuse uh, heads for the bigger flies. Yep. It was black only. Yep. And then your size eights, um, black and olive and chartreuse and olive. And they're very specific about it. Mm. They said, nothing else, don't do anything else. So orange and, orange and what? Orange and black. Orange and black, yeah. With, with some flash, UV, yeah. uh, orange and black, 
and chartreuse and black. Yeah. And then uh, what's the other list here? Uh, the other one was uh, olive and black uh, bead. Olive and black beads. Yeah. Okay. Well, they would know. Then and you'd be um, black hot orange, black okay. chartreuse, olive and black, and olive and hot orange. Okay. Now, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if those colors are are because of the color of the water you're fishing. Oh, you muted it again. It's it's not crystal clear water. Yeah. Um, it is in spots, um, clear water, but mostly it's got a slight sort of a muddy tinge to it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think if you're going to be fishing these in, in lakes around here, around Victoria, uh, I, I don't know how many guys fish leeches around here. Uh, a lot of the golden rods guys do. I mean, I know yeah. fishes leeches a lot. And, and I would think that they, they would work around here because the water here is not uh not crystal clear in, in the potholes around here the lakes around here they're eutrophic lakes so they're they have a a, a tan or a, a greenish tint to them and uh they're not crystal clear so i yeah. think anything that has has black with some contrasting color is going to work yeah actually interestingly enough i found prospect lake very clear yeah at the moment I, I don't fish prospect because i can't get my boat in how big is your boat dave it's a 10 foot zodiac but it's on a trailer yeah i back my trailer down yeah yeah I have a 12 foot boat um no problem i mean it's a it's a very long boat ramp yeah i'm crappy at backing Are you? <laughs> trailer yeah i'm really bad at backing well trailer. i did it in the military a lot so it's a, it's a well, maybe I'll have to come out with you one day. And... Hey, I'm happy to take you out. Okay, yeah. gents, I have to actually get going. So uh, okay. take care. I look forward to seeing Florence uh, tie on uh, video later yeah. uh, when it comes out. So uh, have a good day and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye, bye bye. Okay. I'm going to disappear for about three minutes. I got to go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> So what do you think, Florin? How does that work to, to you? It's it's okay. I can uh, I can wait. Uh, I no, can... no, I mean, how how, do, how does the fly look to you? Uh, this this looks pretty good. Yeah, and once it gets wet, it's uh, it's nicely <clears throat> it's nicely streamlined. Yeah. And for me, I like I said, I I fish mostly like one full size smaller, if not two sizes smaller than what you have in the vice there. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of fishing, you know, um, in a lake, I would I would strip this because I'm I'm not patient to set up two anchors and a bobber. Uh, but in a stream, I found that fishing this thing on a on a floating line like a like a wet fly, yeah, just kind of swing it, and also with a bobber, so that you you can control the depth. A little yeah. bit better yeah. yeah um that that works pretty well you know fished wet fly swing uh not even you know strip it when you when you get to the when you get your line parallel to the bank yeah. but otherwise um you know if it's if it's deeper water and you're and you're fishing upstream or something like that then you go and strip but otherwise um yeah and it's you know, when you tie these things, is the other thing is tying, you know, you can think you're tying leeches, but sometimes it's it's better to think you're tying streamers. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's 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 it is I think it is like a streamer. Or maybe the, the streamers are actually leeches as far as the switch concerned. <laughs> uh it's 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 hard to tell because some of these more compact ones that I tie. Yeah um i'm thinking more streamer than i'm thinking leech yeah you know right i'm back there yeah. and the other thing is this particular style of tying 
is adaptable to to other nymphs and uh, yeah i'd like to do some um i haven't done them yet but i'd like to do some vampire leeches which are yeah. pretty generic attractor and also water boatmen i think it's worth the challenge there is to get that sort of stubby compact size so i think yeah. oversize bead is gonna have to be the ticket for that so it is, it is i'm gonna have to do some more r d on that uh to get that for, going for back swimmers yeah 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 so they, here's uh i'm gonna start sharing my screen okay so i can show you what i'm gonna tie today just you know the the variations on this are pretty much endless um so here's um here's the fly and so this is a small guy it's a size uh, 10 short shank jig hook which of course comes out quite quite longer once you add in the pin and the bead and it's basically a black and peacock color combination and you can do whatever you like I'm trying, I have a few experimental ones here that I'm going to show at the end where I'm trying to do a damselfly style. Is that a, a, a Florian, is that a firehole hook? Uh, no, this is, uh, this is what the uh, Canadian Lama okay. is selling. It's very similar to the Hanak hooks that Dave showed. Uh, it's, um, it's a jig hook. Uh, that's kind of a known name uh, for Czech nymphing, sold by Canadian Lama. And Troutbaum has a very similar one that's about $4, 4 dollars four twenty-five. Yeah, and it, looks, it just looks like a really kind of a powerful thick hook. It, yeah. It's <coughs> good solid higher. It has that little upturned, uh, upturned uh, point. Right. They're barbless. I like them. They, and you said they have like $4? For twenty five, yeah, that's pretty cheap. Well, it's let's just say it's a little less expensive than the other guys. Um, you, you can get long. a similar hook from Togans, I think, as well. Uh, the Togans ones are more of a straight point. Yeah, they don't have the upturned point, and they're yeah. just slightly lighter wire. And it's this is so Canadian. This is splitting Canadian hairs long. here, but. I, I think this this shape wise and everything else this this looks like a like a pretty good hook and I'm gonna try I'm gonna order some from Trout Bum because I do I do think they're pretty much the same as the ones Canadian Lama sells and they're they're better they're better price anyway so I get a clump of marabou I strip it off the feather. And then what I do is I prepare it a little bit before I tie it on. So what I want to do is I don't want to have too long of a tail. So I just break off the extra length. You always get a bit uneven, uneven tips. And never cut the never cut the marabou tails. Just break them off. They look much, much better. Okay, so measure something like, you know, shank length or whatever you like to have, actually whatever you happen to like and attach the marabou this is going to be a little bit of a fuzzy affair okay so here's the tail on and now I'm going to cut the rest because I don't want the body to turn out to be too bulky then I want a little bit of flash in the tail I was fishing these things recently in very murky water and they worked very well. So what I do is I take a strand of silver flashaboo. Oh, sorry, crystal flash. And you can you can do this more efficiently, but no rush. What I'm going to do is I'm going to double it up and put tail length on one side. Attach it. And I'm going to turn the fly around and I'm going to fold this over 
Oops. And that will give me some flash on the other side. I can cut it. And then you can leave it like this if you just want just a little bit of discrete flash in there. Or you can add another two strands to have it a little flashier in the tail. It's just a matter of personal preference, I think. There's no magic magic quantity of flash here. I'm going to <clears throat> like to have like six strands. So I'm going to put another two strands right on top. So by doing it this this way, it's a little bit more complicated and it's a little bit more time consuming. But this is a very, very easy fly otherwise. So if you can afford to spend the extra time. And what this does, it just envelops that tail with flash. So you got flash basically all around. Okay. Now the next thing is the main body, which is small size black chenille that I have on a card. And I keep on a card. I don't, I don't cut pieces out of this. The only thing I do is I'm going to use the rotary feature like Dave. So just strip a little bit of the fluff at the tip when you tie it in. This will lessen the bulk and will give you a very secure tie in. Just do it like that. Let this hang out of the way. Move the thread forward <coughs> and secure it with a quick knot. Okay, now I'm gonna put the thread out of the way and wrap my body. So here again, you can use any color of chenille that you like. You can play with different color combinations. I have black, purple, I have some uh, olive chenille. I just go up to about here, just on the, on the main shank of the hook and I'm going to put peacock curl on the pin. So now I'm going to attach this. Trim and move the thread now on the pin. I'm going to grab some peacock and here you can use, you know, low grade peacock. You don't need any, any fancy stuff. So I'm using about four strands of peacock. I trim those, those weak tips. And I'm going to attach this. So this is basically that little gap between the uh, the angle shank and the pin and just move the thread forward. Okay, I like to do this by hand rather than doing it rotary. So just fill in that that gap there where the eye of the hook is. and gradually build the body all the way to behind the bead. And when you come to the end, the usual thing, secure. If you want this much sturdier or if you're fishing a very toothy, toothy fish, just do a dubbing loop with a peacock and that's going to make the peacock absolutely indestructible at the expense of a little bit of fuzziness. Okay. And that is the fly. And again, two wipe finishes. 
in case the first one fails. Sometimes it does after sufficiently many fish. You've got a backup. And done. You can whip up a dozen of these things pretty quickly. As we were chatting earlier, I've got two, four, six, eight flies done. So this is the this is the black and silver flash version with a peacock head. Like I said, this worked quite well in, in murky water. You get that you get that contrast, you get a little bit of flash. Uh, the fish just loved it. And the other version that I'm experimenting with right now is the same idea, but with an olive green theme. And this is actually tied on a size smaller. So this is a size 12. And what I'm using here for the tail is I have some dyed uh, pheasant rump. It has some nice, nice fluff here at the base of the feather. That's very good for making tails, as good as marabou. And then I have some olive chenille. It's officially called peacock olive. Also size small. And then actual peacock curl for the front. And I'd like to think that this might work well in... Uh, situations where you have damsel flies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also kind of the right size for a damsel. It's it's a small a slightly smaller fly. And um, I haven't tried other other color combinations, but I don't see why they wouldn't work. And that's that's that. Everything well, else they've said about hook preparation and so on, you know. Uh, applies here as well balancing and and whatnot and of course these ones you don't have to do any uh any hair dressing on them they just yeah they're good to go as they come off the vice so so florin with the peacock head one do you find that you every once in a while you kind of got it false cast to air dry it to get a little more uh sparkle at the front end of that fly no, I don't. I just no. I just go with it. The only thing I find is that that the peacock eventually wears off. Yeah. And um, I just put the hook back in the vise, and I tie some fresh peacock. Good. On top, no problem. Yeah. And if it breaks off, you just put the fly aside. The rear end is indestructible. Yeah. You know, and like I said, you can use a dubbing loop. And there, there are some other tricks actually you can um, you can do that that can be um, can be interesting to play with, which is using actually some crystal flash to dub um, as a dubbing loop for the peacock. Mm. And what that does is it it creates some built-in additional sparkle in the peacock. It mm. makes your uh, it makes your peacock curl uh, stronger as well. It's interesting, so, two completely different takes on, on leeches. Yeah. 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 And like I said, you were, you were gone, Tony, but basically um, I would, when, when I tie these things, I, you know, they may, the fish may take them as leeches, but I, my suspicion is they actually take them as streamers, little minnows, you know? <clears throat> so just think of how you would, you would tie a little streamer yeah. size 10 and smaller right so we're talking little minnows in you know like the local lakes you have out there and we have around yeah. edmonton um, but like, what, what's what's interesting um i guess it depends how you fish them because you yeah. could actually troll some of these leeches and they would be more like a streamer yeah. yes as opposed to fishing them on a bobber or something like that you know um and yeah. fishing them real slow um they work both ways yeah and in a streamer again you were you were away i was telling dave so i'm going to repeat myself here a little bit but basically uh i would fish them either under a bobber or on a floating line and swing them 
in the current like I would a wet fly. Mm. Mind you, this is a very heavy wet fly. So if the yeah. water is deeper, you you can go you can go naked, no bobber. It just it works well. Right. If you're fishing very shallow water, you may want to put in a bobber to control the depth better for no other purpose. The bobber serves no purpose other than it it keeps it shallower. And the other thing is if you're fishing this thing at dusk, putting a bright yellow bobber there really shows you where it, it, it makes for well, a it's, better it's, control swing. Yeah, it's an interesting way to fish is to, to just, if it's a little bit windy and there's a little chop on the water, is you don't move, you just let the wind blow your boat. And if yep. there's a little chop with a bobber, all it's 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 just giving plenty of action. Oh, that's a yeah. lot of action. Yeah. You know, yeah, th that's that's precisely what it's going to show here is is again, if it's on a bobber and and yeah. it's going up and down, you look at how that that thing breathes. Yeah. I mean, no, absolutely. You know, and, and whether it's a leech or whether they take it for a leech is a minnow, it's it's the live liveliness of the pattern i think that right. makes the difference on those that's yeah. that's why i think that's why i think phil's uh phil's balance leeches work so well is that if you're dubbing the body and it's got some bulk to it it just it looks alive it's, it's not just yeah. a static thing you know it's it's it's, it's interesting you know guys fishing i mean you get dale who likes to fish one and a half to two and a half miles an hour yeah miles an hour not kilometers yeah and you know, until it gets super cold and the fish is slow and then he might slow down to you know one yeah yeah but that business of you know just drifting if it's a light breeze yeah. um just let yourself drift and uh yeah, daydream if you're patient. You actually outside. don't even need to bother sometimes. You just sit there and hold your rod. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, because the boat's moving. Well, that's that's the beauty with with chronomets as well, right? Because yeah. if you're fishing chronomets when you, I, I've I've not done much here. Certainly in Alberta, a lot of the potholes I all fish chronomets, and you you put your forceps on them, get them, take them down to the bottom, pull them up a foot and a half. Yeah. Set strike indicator and then you just cast out and uh let it sit and if you've got a little bit of ripple on the surface from a light wind it's yeah. just deadly yeah that 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 little that little larva just goes up and down and up and down right. and I, right. it's the movement that gets the fish coming over yeah well now we've done that and now I, my next task once i'm finished these bloody things is i've got to tie a bunch of these yeah uh, Dave, stop. can you stop the recording, maybe? Yep. Let's just catch that. Uh, let's go here. There we go. Yeah.